about five, 3.45 ish, so we'll get going. So, uh, my name is Jonathan, and I'm going to talk today about uh, build software like Pixar makes movies, and uh, what would a talk about Pixar be without an invocation <laughs> as sorts? Uh, so, a little Luxo Jr. for you. Uh, what many people don't realize is that Luxo Jr. is actually a derivative of one of the first shorts ever done by Pixar, one of their early pieces of work. And uh, it's, it kind of goes on to show you how they've used shorts and ideas over many years, uh, not only to drive their software and hardware forward, but also to drive their creative process and bring up new directors. So I'm currently the VP of design at Powerfleet, uh, where I work remote from Charlottesville on our, our small farm. I'm also a Rails programmer dabbling in Ember and Angular. Uh, I did write this. It's way out of date and out of print, but if you have any Rails view questions, I can rock it. So I come to 3D and things about Pixar and all that kind of world from a very weird place. I have a master's in architecture of the building variety. And in architecture school, back in the late 90s at Catholic U, we did immersive 3D studios. So this is early 3D Studio Max. Um, we had a lot of things that we would want to do in design that were just super difficult to do. So I had one renderer that was a 10 second shot going up through a glass atrium. It took three and a half days to render at 640 by 480. Um, nowadays, that would render in um, maybe an hour, uh, and at, at like HD res. Um, so for a half, you know, for half a decade, my job was doing 3D visualization for architecture firms and and uh, like RTKL, HNTB, uh, including the Capitol Visitor Center. We worked on the Pentagon reconstruction after 9/11. We did this, which was the DC Olympic bid for 2012. They obviously didn't get it, but uh, the whole bottom of this frame is fake. Uh, most people would know that if you know DC, you know the Anacostia River has never ever been that blue. Uh, so I've, I've run this company since 97, it's called Meticulous, and this is where I've done a lot of the 3D work, uh, including in 2005 we did a short film with a friend from high school who was a director. My sister and I produced, we were building this on our laptops, and we ended up printing to film at the very end, uh, and it was good enough to get us a pitch meeting with Blue Sky Studios who did Ice Age Robots. Um, but we had this film idea that was a kung fu movie for kids. Nowadays, you're like, oh, Kung Fu Panda, but at the time, that hadn't been announced yet. Yeah, and we were going through the whole process. Lisa Fragner, who's the head of development for Fox, went to LA to pitch this as part of their annual pitch, and front page of Variety, DreamWorks announces Kung Fu Panda. So that was the end of our, our run in that regard. But So I love 3D. I love Pixar. I love storytelling, but I have one thing to tell you up front here. I lied. This is not a talk about building software. It's a talk about creative endeavors, of which software is one. So this is more about managing creatives and including software development. Um, I had a couple of friends when I first pitched this idea for a talk ask me if this was a talk about how to spend four years to get to release. It is not. Uh, if it was a talk about how to spend, uh, how to make software that has you crying for 20 minutes but everything works out okay in the end. Again, no. And also or how uh, software can have 47 minutes of silent introductions. Uh, thank you, Wally. Let's get there. Yeah, there's sound. Okay, cool. Um, so this is not just uh, creative people in the artist sense of the word, right, in, in air quotes. Pixar is made up of artists, managers, but Pixar is a software company. A lot of people don't realize this. The, one of the main products that Pixar makes and a lot of the things that revolve around how they work is a thing called RenderMan, which we'll show in depth here later. Um, and so they have everything that we have in the tech world. They have unit production managers, which are like our PMO, um, and, and all these different things working together to come up with great creative entertainment. So like any good hero's journey or Presbyterian sermon, we're, I'm never going to get tired of that joke. We have three parts here. We got a history lesson, people in candor, and then making spaces. So a lot of this, we have to kind of understand how we got to where we are. The computers you use have so much technology developed by Ed Catmull and the other people at Pixar that you use every day without realizing it. So let's go through our little origin story here. Uh, we're going to go back into the 1970s up through about Toy Story. So 1972, Ed Catmull who is current, he just retired as the president of Pixar and Disney Animation. Uh, he's a computer scientist, and he uh, is probably best known not only for running Pixar, but for teaching Steve Jobs how to manage creatives effectively, which I believe is a huge part of Apple's success in the second era of Jobs. Uh, so he's at the University of Utah, uh, and people are like, University of Utah, what's, what's University of Utah? Well, University of Utah was one of the first four nodes of ARPANET. Early, early comp sci, big deal. And here's the growth of ARPANET up through July 77. Um, and a lot of the stuff they're working on here is early, early computer animation. 
Um, now this isn't render and play it back on my screen kind of computer animation like we can do these days. Everything is coded by hand. All of this is writing software that then generates an image. And it's all, we're talking about like they're manually defining vertices in 3D space. Um, and they're printing frame by frame static images to film and then playing back that reel of film on a projector. So it takes a little bit of time here. So this is one of his first things he's ever done, and this is his hand. And so what, they're, what they've done here, this is just they took his hand and they've, they've made a polygon. So they've, they've broken this into a ton of polygons. And they literally drew all these triangles, in some cases rectangles, all over. And then what happens is they're going to take a 3D digitizer, which is basically an XYZ coordinate pen, and they're going to trace every one of those polygons, and that's going to take that information into a computer. So this is early digitization. Nowadays we have fancy scanners that do this without touching the thing, but this is back in the early days. And then this becomes what's called a wireframe. And what, from here you can start animating. The problem is now you have deformation. So when this, when you're, if you look at your hand and you open and close it, your skin stretches and things like that. Polygon models don't do that well. That's, you know, there's a lot of things happening in here. So the, the end of the day, you know, you're moving into shading and lighting here too, which are the basics of this. So if there's a, a light projecting onto this, it then reflects and that's what gives you like, this is like a thing in space. So. A lot of the things that he's inventing here, along with other people in, in his program, are polygon modeling, subdivision surfaces, how a surface is broken up into smaller pieces, texture mapping, and Z-buffer. So Z-buffer is how things are placed from a camera plane to you. So you like when you play video games or anything like that, something moving behind another thing is, a Z, is, is in the Z-buffer. And so we use that in CSS as Z-index. So these are things that all come out of, in a weird way, come out of 3D animation. So they tried to pitch this technology to Disney. Disney had zero interest. This was, you know, this is the era of 101 Dalmatians. This is traditional hand animation, camera planes. You know, they had done the, the parallax with the multiple plane camera stuff. That was, that's how we do animation. We don't use computers. So 1974, Ed goes up to New York and works at the New York Institute of Technology. And he's brought in to create an animated movie of some kind on a computer. They don't know what, but that's that's the kind of the goal. And he starts hiring random people that he can find that are doing cool stuff in this space. And this is a, a recent picture of one, one of those gentlemen named Alvy Ray Smith. Um, and Catmull is quoted as saying that most of the people he hires swim circles around him. And there's this mentality that he feels that they probably could do his job better, but his job was not to do the work. His job was to build the team and bring the project to fruition and manage the creative process. So that's, you know, coming up with finding amazing people and then managing them well. And here they create two things, tweening and motion blur, which we use all the time in CSS animation. So tweening is when I say it's keyframe animation. Here's A, here's B. The computer calculates over the number of frames what it does from here to there. Now motion blur so it, it is what makes it go so it doesn't go chop, 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 chop. It makes it go nice and smooth. So if you freeze a frame in there, it looks like a blurry ball, but that's, or if you're moving a ball from A to B. So that's the kind of stuff that uh, is coming out of this process at this time. So some of the learnings here is like, obviously, hire the best people you can, get them on board, and go as fast as you can. 1977, besides being the year I was born, something very important happened here. I think you might know what it is. Um, Lucas debuted this, and the world, you know, what was possible on screen changed forever. And this is... You know, Industrial Light and Magic was born from Star Wars. This is an optical printer. So before computer animation and all this stuff, you would film an element, you'd film a background, you'd film another element, and then you would put them together and, as the, and you'd shoot those three frames one at a time onto a new piece of film negative and then print that. You're, you end up with a photocopy problem. So if you go back and look at the original Star Wars, you see some chunkiness when they're, especially around the Death Star flight sequences and stuff like that. It doesn't look that great. They cleaned it up in the release edition, but go look at the original. It was really amazing for 1977, but for 2019, you're like, oh my God, that's awful. So 
a lot of artifacts, a lot of visual issues with some of that stuff and the way it comes out, but it was so cutting edge that nobody really compared. I mean, that's 40 years ago, right? 40, 42 years ago now? So, 79, the team is left New York Institute of Technology and has been hired by Lucas. Lucas is like, we're going to computers, this is, there's a future here, let's play with it, let's see what we can do. At the time, film editing is done this way, this is a light table. And you literally are going and rolling through a positive, cutting it with a razor blade and taping it together. And that's a cut, that's an edit. Um, and so Lucas wanted to do this on computer. How can I do this on the computer? Because this is incredibly destructive. Once you've made that cut, if you want to extend it by three more frames, you've got to go find the piece. And this is the phrase left on the cutting room floor. Find the piece somewhere on the cutting room floor, get those three frames, tape it again. Audio is cut the same way at this time with the razor blade and magnetic tape. And it's, it's amazing to watch people that can actually do it, do it. But uh, I, I'm glad we have the computers to do it now. So they invented something called Droidworks. What's fascinating is when they first took this to the editors, the editors were like, this, no, what is this? This is awful, this is not editing. It's a computer. And so there's so many visual artifacts here from the nature of editing film. You have a rolled up piece of film here, and there's your cut. You know, you, here's a, a cross dissolve between the two, which if you were doing that, you'd actually have in optical printing, you'd, you'd print them differently over top of each other. And that's how you would do the dissolves. So they didn't go and talk to the users beforehand. They just built the system saying, we're going to do this on the computer. And the users didn't want it. So the big leaps in technology often require as much vision as testing. Like if they just went and asked, them, I mean, this is the oft attributed incorrectly quote to Henry Ford of they'd ask for faster horses, um, which he never said. But it's, you know, it's, there's some of this where you can go ask people what they need and they're going to say incremental, well, this is what I want, this is what I want. But sometimes there's a big vision that has to happen. At the same time, you have to get some buy-in. So over time, they came around and you're starting to look at blue screen. This is the eight, early 80s. They basically invented blue screen technology. So you could actually film something on a screen and it's called chroma key. By the color, you could knock out a color and have a transparent background. They also created a piece of hardware. This is Pixar's first foray into, it was, well, this is not yet Pixar. Pixar is the piece of hardware at this point. Um, it was a mix of the Spanish verb pixar, which is to make pictures, and radar. That's where the word came from. Two foot square cube, less power than the iPhone one, barely as much power as a Mac SE, and all it was really doing was complex image processing. Had a couple things that it could be pro run through. It was mainly sold into medical facilities. Three to 500 of them were ever made. So if you ever find one, I would gladly take it off your hands. It's, it's just a great paperweight at this point, right? But uh, it's a pretty cool paperweight. Um, and so one of the first images, this is a test image called the road to Point Reyes. So Point Reyes is this uh, area in the, the Bay Area of California. Um, and what you can see here you're starting to see what the sumato, so like the, uh, the Renaissance paintings, how the, 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 the background fades off, that haze, that humidity in the atmosphere. They're starting to capture that kind of stuff. You're starting to see transparency, translucency through the rainbow. You're seeing reflections. So it's not just a flat mirror reflection down here in the water. The water has a texture to it that affects the reflection. These are all these kind of things that were cutting edge, never been done before. And the first time you really see this in a movie is Star Trek II Wrath of Khan. This entire sequence was rendered in, the, their, in their algorithm. So Reyes, they, this in typical military algorithm fashion, renders everything you ever saw. But everything you're seeing here is done through the Reyes algorithm. The fire, and when you pass through the flame, then you go into the, the environment starts to be built up. So the mountains come up, the water fills in, all this fractal mapping, so all that is one of the first big computer generation things. I mean, no one had seen this before. This was completely new. Um, so big text here, blue screen, the nonlinear editing, and then Reyes. Uh, 1983, Disney finally comes knocking. They're like, Lucasfilm, for those of you who don't know, is based up in Marin County, North San Francisco. And this was an intentional decision by Lucas after Star Wars. He wanted to be close enough to LA for an hour flight, but far enough away that no one would just stop by. And so they fly on up, and a young one of the, they bring a whole bunch of their animation team up. One of those individuals is John Lasseter. 
Um, they had not had any major technological jumps at Disney since 101 Dalmatians, which was 1961. So we're now 22 years with no real big tech jumps in animation. Um, the famous nine old men of the animation lore had retired or not, were not really into the day-to-day -day management at this point anymore too. So there was kind of this like lack of energy. It was kind of stagnation. And apparently the story goes that Lasseter basically stared at this image on the wall for 15 minutes just like dissecting every little detail. Um, goes back down, he pitches the concept for Brave Little Toaster and is effectively fired the next day. <laughs> so he gets a phone call a few weeks later from Ed Catmull who had heard about this and said, hey, we're working on this thing for SIGGRAPH. SIGGRAPH is the annual computer science uh, graphics uh, conference that happens every year, still happens today. And um, SIGGRAPH is most of the animation stuff that had happened at this point, it was like, here's Voyager flying by Jupiter. Like that was the extent of the animation stuff. And they wanted to do something different. And so Lasseter's like, great, see you tomorrow. Be right, be right up there. And um, so this is the graphics group at this point at Lucasfilm with Lasseter there in the middle. And Alvy Ray Smith is holding the clicker. Catmull is to his left with the glasses. And so they were working on this concept of a short, which was, uh, they weren't able to finish rendering it before SIGGRAPH. But when, when Lasseter got up there, it just didn't have anything to it. They wanted, they had a, a character and a B, and it just was like, hmm. So Lasseter helped them reinvent the story, come up with something that they could care about, and that would be, it's only like a minute long. But this is like, again, one of those things that no one had seen. So they show this, and about halfway through, they have to switch to wireframe, because they didn't have time to render everything. But nobody cared because they had gotten, by the time it switched to wireframe, they had gotten invested in the characters and the story. And this was like lights going off for everyone involved. So this is really short. We'll just watch it real quick because it's one of those pieces if you haven't seen is, in hindsight, it's kind of fun to look at just to see how far we've come <laughs> graphics wise. This has as much, if not more, character development than Steamboat Willie, which is the early Disney black and white Mickey Mouse, right? So he basically tries to trick the bee, runs away. Bee's not very happy about that for being tricked. Bee stabs him in the butt. Pretty simple story, but it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> fun. That's it. That's the whole thing. The, the credits are almost as long as the entire short. Um, but this is the wireframe. So it switched over to something that looked like this about halfway through. But they still, it like still resonated with people. People were like, that was so amazing. So this is something, one of, one of Ed's quotes here is, you know, for all the care you put into, vis into, into artistry, visual polish doesn't matter if you're not getting the story right. So before, uh, now developers, before you start thumbing your nose at your fellow design staff, Awesome technology doesn't matter if you're not getting the experience right. This is the way I want to translate that to you. So it's great that we can work in the newest Node.js or this, whatever, but if the experience is awful, the framework is irrelevant. 1985, Steve Jobs is out of Apple and he started Next. Um, and Lucas is going through a divorce and is selling off assets, one of them being the computer graphics group. So Jobs buys it for five million. He gives Ed a budget of an additional five million to do R and D and develop stuff. Because at this point, Jobs' mentality is expensive computers, high-end computing, science application stuff. That's what Next is doing. That's where his mindset is. So, Pixar is a hundred percent hardware and software R and D company. Um, they're burning cash. What does this sound like? A lot of startups, doesn't it? So again, we've got the Pixar image computer, and it's going to three-letter agencies. It's going to medical companies. Um, but, but neither Steve or any of the team have ever sold high-end computing hardware at scale. So nobody really quite knows how to make this thing convert. During this time, Ed Catmull's looking at the process and how the team works and things like that. And, uh, and some of the things he starts bringing in are a lot of the, what we would call today lean concepts. Um, 
one of the individuals at this point that he's, he's enamored with is a gentleman named W. Edwards Denning, who in the 1940s um, helped rebuild Japan. He was working there in 47 and um, worked with uh, Akita Morita of Sony, and one of the companies that they, they were implementing total quality control. And instead of, especially in Japan, a very hierarchical structure, they kind of turned it on its head and anybody could stop the production line. This is one of the, where this came, comes in. So res, re, pushing the responsibility of finding problems down to every single employee. So from the most senior manager down to the lowliest worker, everyone's responsible for quality. And visually, it looks like this. Anywhere there's, you know, X number of workstations, something's wrong with this car. Somebody can literally pull a handle, 100% focus, fix the problem, turn the line back on. And this is a huge deal um, at the time. Like, this was not, people would just pull things out of the line, and the line would keep going. But this, this was a kind of turning industrial on its head. So taking this and applying this to creative endeavors and software endeavors that anybody could raise a red flag and say, this is not working and here's why. Everybody focus, laser focus, let's fix this problem, then move back to our regular development cycle. So workers' engagement strengthens the resulting product. Everyone's invested, everyone cares. Uh, and this all eventually starts to trickle in through HP and Apple in the 1980s in Silicon Valley. Um, and so we all start seeing all the, the concepts that we today think of, the Toyota production system, lean, all that stuff starts to come in at that point. But it took a while. So 1987, uh, they're doing R&D. They're improving Reyes and came up with the, this is where they finally said, oh, this means renders everything you ever saw. So, the, you know, fun little thing. And this is Luxo Jr. So this is the first time they get an Oscar nomination for a short. Uh, and basically for those, I don't have it in here, but for those you haven't seen, the little lamp and it's like the baby lamp and the mama lamp kind of thing and, and the, the baby lamp's jumping on the ball, which is where that whole opening sequence now gets replayed over and over again. Um, and it's modeled after a draftsman lamp that they had on their tables where they were doing traditional drawing stuff. Um, their first Oscar win is in 1988 for Tin Toy. Um, and you can start looking at this stuff. You know, the room looks okay, the toys look okay, the baby looks freaky. <laughs> yeah, that's just, you know, I mean, it shows you how far we've come on, on rendering people. Uh, but now if you think about this, every 18 months or so there's a new short from Pixar. Usually they get attached to a feature, but they also have interme uh, intermediary ones too. They push technology, so they're like, oh, we need to render fur. Let's do a, a you know, five minute short on fur. But at the same time, they're like, well, let's make a cool story. And they'll have a junior director work that. Because a five minute investment compared to a 90 minute investment for production is a lot easier to say, eh, it didn't work. 90 minutes, you got a lot of people to explain yourself to. When you, if you say, we shut down a feature two years into production. So a much better budget. And this is kind of the thing, like small focus prototypes. We do this in development, right? We're going to do a sprint. We may throw it away, but it's we're going to learn something about our tech. We're going to learn something about how to build things. And then we can go apply that to a bigger product. So, and this, this also applies not just to code, but UI as well. So like clickable prototypes, paper prototypes, things like using like a, a framer or um, Sketch or Marvel or any of these kind of tools to try something out before you spend all the time to build it out. Test first, then build. So again, three to 300 to 500. This is not a high performing product. They don't know what to do. 1989, uh, Jobs has a couple times now tried to sell Pixar. He, never, he could never go through with it. He talks to Bill Gates. He talks to a couple other people, gets offers. And it, I mean, we can't ask him now, but and nobody ever asked him while he was alive, but Ed Catmull's conjecture is, is that Jobs was trying to convince himself he made the right bet. So if somebody said, that's, I'll pay you 20 million, he's like, okay, well, it's at least worth 30. I'm good. I'll stick around. We'll keep going. I'll keep dumping money into it. Um, and, but at this point, they also deliver their first piece of software, computer animated production system. And this is sold to Disney. This is the first time, the biggest jump in Disney animation that has ever happened, you know, since 1961. So 30 years, no changes at Disney, and then they dump this in. Caps is basically a way for them to paint cells in the computer. So each frame of animation, they can do the color, coloring in the computer now. Uh, it also allowed them to do things that they couldn't traditionally do with the, the, the hand tools. So the, the first sequence that this is ever used in is the end of The Little Mermaid. And it's the uh, transparency in the rainbow is what they, is what they use this to, to achieve. Uh, and, but this ushered in, like this was like the, one of the things that started off the new, new um, 
90s era of Disney animation. You got Beauty and the Beast, you got The Lion King, you got The Little Mermaid. All these things were technologically enabled by CAPS. And they still have one CAPS system sitting at Disney to pull up old pieces of work. Uh, but it's, it's out of production at this point. So, 1990, you know, 91 now, we're, they're like, okay, CAPS is working great. Katzenberg's running Disney. He comes up and says to Jobs, I want a feature animated film. And I think you guys can do it. I've seen you've got some Oscar nods. You, get, you know what you're doing. You've got some good storytelling. Let's, let's talk about this. They wanted to buy all the technology, too. And Jobs, in the typical Jobs distortion field, was like, these are not the droids you're looking for. Basically said, you're going to give us three pictures. We keep all the tech. You just get the rights to the picture. And Katzenberg said, okay. So 1993, as this is all going on, they're starting to work on what becomes Toy Story. Um, they win an Oscar for Render Man. Render Man is the Reyes algorithm packaged in a suite of tools. Um, it's Terminator 3, I'm sorry, Terminator 2 heavily relied on this. That entire piece on the right there, the reflection of the person and everything is all straight out of Render Man. And so this is, I mean, this is 93, this is cutting edge. And this still looks good today. Like the Mercury, the guy, and you know, Robert Patrick turning into Mercury. I mean, like, it's still a pretty cool shot. Um, so it wins the technical Oscar this year. Uh, and they're in full swing on Toy Story, but Toy Story is not what we think of as Toy Story. Um, and I, I hope the audio is loud enough for you all to hear this. But um, there's something, this is November 19th, 1993, referred to as Black Friday at Pixar. So Pixar is working on stuff and coming down. They're doing what are called storyboards. So they hand sketch a lot of frames and they put them in an editor and then they can kind of show a mini movie with the actors voicing the script. And so instead of rendering everything out, you know, you kind of get the story right and then you spend time making the final shots. And they've been going back and forth and Disney keeps giving them notes and change the character this way, make it more this, make him more angry, make him more hip. Uh, and this came out on the recent re-release of... Uh, this is the reel that we showed on Black Friday before we re-envisioned Woody's character. It's, um, you know, it's bad, you know, <laughs> it's really bad. Um, it's kind of rough to watch these days. But I, hey, for history's sake, I think it's important to see, you know. Um, so uh, this takes place right before they go to Pizza Planet. And all of the other toys are placing bets is to, to, to see who Andy's going to take, either Woody or Buzz Lightyear. Woody! Ah, oh, I'd just like to wish you luck. I, I, I know you'd do the same for me. Oh, yeah, yeah. What? 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 What are you? What's everybody looking at? What? Hey, he slipped. I tried to. He. I couldn't hold that. It was an act. He slipped. Hey, I thought I'd see him. I think he fell onto the street. Maybe he's gonna drug kill. <laughs> he ain't going to pizza now. Woody, you deliberately threw Buzz out the window. <laughs> Toy, toy world. Oh. Cowboy, where is your honor, dirtbag? You are an absolute disgrace. You don't deserve to wear a 10-gallon hat on your pint-sized head. Men, search and rescue. I want a medevac team on the double. Hey, Hustle up. Move it, move it, move it. Hey. Hey, a pretty hey, dark version brain. of Woody, isn't it? <laughs> what do you think you're doing? So uh, the they had been trying to follow the direction hey. from Pixar execs to make Woody Off hipper, cooler, you're darker, a little more mysterious. Woody? No. Um, so Key. they show this reel, Slanky. and Katzenberg shuts down Slanky. production. He's Slanky. like, "What are you? What are we doing?" Get up, um, and in, in some of the longer interviews, um, deaf? he says, "You got to fix the script." And he turns to another sorry, one of the Disney buddy, execs and says, "What happened?" And he said, "They're not making the movie they want to make. They're making the movie we told them to make." By admitting that we made bad calls on our notes. So it's it's a pretty it's pretty hilarious. I mean, like. Give Tom Hanks credit that he was, he was like, yeah, I'll deliver that line. Um, so Lasseter is like, just give me two weeks. Don't, because like he's, when he's a shutdown production, he's like, fire your staff. Like you are done. This movie is done. And Lasseter is, give me two weeks. Come back in two weeks. And if it's still bad, then we can shut it down. So basically they go in and this is, you know, just in the typical like crazy, like, fix all the things, storyboarding kind of world. Like, we can fix this. We'll get, we're going to turn the story back around the way we want. And 
you have to go down these rabbit holes sometimes. You have to find all those dead ends in your creative process, and that's being software, design, storytelling, doesn't matter. If you don't find it out, often the product will be weaker because of it. And this is a great quote, is just to project the future, not the past. So yes, it was done this way. Yes, this is how it's been, but what's the right way going forward? Um, obviously, we now have four Toy Story movies. I think they're all pretty great. Uh, you may agree with that statement, but uh, so they were obviously able to fix it. So the way out is through, to quote Trent Reznor indirectly, um, the creative cruft, and then take advice, but always trust your gut and your team to make the story product you know you need to make. Uh, we see this a lot with venture capitalists, right? Come in and say, oh, you should do this with your product. You should do this. Why don't you, why don't you tackle this? Why don't you go after this thing? And it takes a strong leadership team to be able to say, no, nope, that's, that's not where the product needs to go. I, I mean, yes, the comp competition is doing that, but that's not where we need to go. And the way they, they solved this, they basically had their best storytellers in the company come together and they created something informally in that be has become a formal institution to Pixar called the Brain Trust. And we'll talk about this a little more when we talk about candor in the second part. So getting to the end here, 1995, and another Jobs moment, he's just, he decides he's going to IPO Pixar the, week, the opening weekend of Toy Story. Talk about confidence in your product, right? So, and it works. Um, it, it doubles the offering price. And so this actually sets Pixar up to not have to get money from anybody. They can pay for their own development now and then sell the movie to somebody. So Jobs is like, Disney's going to come to renegotiate. And everyone's like, all right, dude, whatever. And what happens is that Eisner calls him up, says, I want to renegotiate our deal, and he does. And Jobs basically takes him to the bank. It's everything he wants. Um, but he was in a position of power because they didn't need Disney anymore. Yeah, we'll make your two more movies, but we don't need the money to make those movies. We can make them ourselves. And he was able to, to basically uh, go huge. And so Jobs is a 70% holder of Pixar at this point. And this is how Jobs ends up being the largest shareholder in Disney once when Disney buys Pixar. So when you have a win, leverage it, and always negotiate from a position of power. Uh, the, the famous quote for the latter half of that is, you're never going to do better at a new job negotiation than the day before you sign your acceptance letter. All right, so that's our historical segment. Um, let's, as you know, origin stories are great, but let's talk about people in candor because this is what while software is a very technical thing, we are all individuals, we all have feelings, we're all working together, right? So candor is the quality of being open and honest expression and you know, frankness. And instead of, people will mix this up with honesty. You can be too honest. It's kind of awkward. It's very hard to be too candid, though, if you, if, you comp if you phrase it that way. So in Toy Story, the unit production managers are kind of the, man the people making sure stuff gets from A to B. It's the PMO in, in the technical world, the project management office. Not glorious, but very essential. And the production managers felt that they were second class citizens. They felt that the creatives and the animators were, yay, and they, these guys, oh yeah, you guys, whatever. Uh, but they didn't say anything. You don't rock the boat during production. Uh, but they were all starting to turn in resignations, and they wanted to go elsewhere and do other things. And Cat Mole started pulling them aside and said, what's going on? Um, and they had said we had an open door policy, but there was a mentality of all these people coming out of, of Hollywood that you do not rock the boat during production, you just get the movie done. So they really kind of reinforced this, but it's uh, one of the way Catmull refers to it is if there's more truth in hallways than in meetings, you have a problem. People whispering, but they're not telling you face to face, you got a serious issue. So it's not, it's not about providing feedback in a bad way. One uh, great example from, from my work, um, I worked at Guggenheim Securities for a little while doing UX stuff, and the team lead there was running all the tech stuff, and he had a gr he would do this with the developers too. He had a great way when something wasn't right, he would say, "I love you, I don't love this." Immediately diffuse the when you say this is not right, saying you are not right, because that's what a lot of us go to in our head. We go, "Oh, he hates me. He thinks I'm crap." I mean, it was all the negative self talk spiral right on down to the ground. No, but he, that was an immediate diffusion. It's like, "Oh, okay." I'm good, but we don't have the right solution. So you get past all that you know, roller coaster of emotion and you're right back into let's fix this problem. They applied this on a corporate scale notes day. So you can come in and give a note about anything in the company. Doesn't matter, you don't like the cafeteria? I got a note about the cafeteria, blah, blah, blah. And this is all about, but this is not about just complaining, this is about solutions. 
Jobs was, had a reputation for walking in unannounced into screenings and pointing at people and saying, what's one good thing about Pixar? What's one bad thing about Pixar? And then channeling all those bad things away and taking them and, and asking people to fix them. Like he was, okay, that's so and so, I'll go talk to them about that. So it was this very, it was again, I want candidness. I don't want, you know, it's, it's, I don't want you to just tell me, oh, everything's great, man, yeah. No. So how do we apply this to tech? Retrospectives is obviously the agile you know, name for these things, but notes day, any other means of feedback, whatever you can do to capture this, to break out of this like, nope, head down, we're just gonna build the stuff, blah, 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 I'm coding, I'm not, nope, open door policy. Fix that, get, get that kind of stuff going. If you don't have this, your team's gonna leave, people get bored, they get, they get fed up, they get frustrated, they quit. So super long quote about, <laughs> quote about um, getting lost in the weeds. So a lot of the things that they had issues with too is that they would provide feedback and the directors or some of the new directors especially were so far down in the minutia of things they couldn't see the forest for the trees, quite literally. Um, and this again is where the brain trust you know, kind of evolved to is to be this like reset point. Like you're here, let's pull everybody back and reset and go that direction. Um, so looking at your project life cycle, when are points that you can inject these kinds of things on a regular basis, two weeks? Monthly, quarterly, where does it need to happen? And the Brain Trust is a rotating group of individuals. Um, it's in Pixar, it's their best storytellers. Uh, but the, it's a bunch of diverse viewpoints. It's not always just the people that have been there a long time. Uh, and the goal is to get the best story, and it's irrelevant who said what. They'd have no veto control. All they can do is say, you know, it's like a peer review, but it's a suggestion. Uh, and so for us, this is really a pull request workflow. How many people can you tack onto that pull request to get diverse opinions about how something could have been built or something could be improved? And you can even do this, we did this, uh, Bruce Williams did this a lot at CargoSense, uh, he's now up at GitHub, but he'd open a pull request before they even started coding. And then all the stuff happened and all the commentary happened in the pull request. So you see the entire history of the evolution of that feature in a pull request. So lots of eyes, divergent eyes, and they also have the concept of a co-director. So instead of just your team lead being one person, maybe you have two people and they, they are complementary individuals. So, you know, this guy is great with this and this girl is great with this and together they make an amazing team lead because they have varying opinions, varying technical capabilities. So build your own brain trust for how your team works. Um, and again, don't discount ideas because it's not the right person. If you have a junior developer, it's like, ask you like, well, why are we doing it this way? It's not, well, let's, Let's dig down into that. Um, if a designer comes in and says, what about if we do this? Let's dig into that. Um, example I just had at work, somebody was like, oh, well, that's gonna tax the database too much. Talking to me as a designer, not realizing that I've spent way too much time programming over the last decade, and I asked him why it wasn't a cache database request. And he just kind of looked at me like, oh, you know about caches, okay. So, <laughs> again, like, we're all trying to make great products here. So. Push, push that forward. And fear destroys candor and collaboration. If people are afraid to say things in meetings, you're not gonna have good product. Um, and it's, you know, if people, it's not merely open to the ideas from others, it's, it's engaging the collective. It sounds very um, Star, Star Trek-ish, but uh, you know, as, as a manager, you gotta coax the ideas out of your staff, because sometimes people will be like, oh, my idea, you know, there's that negative self-talk problem, right? You know, my ideas aren't that great, blah, 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 I'm just gonna do this ticket, and So facilitate, find those ways to facilitate the feedback and the ideas. I know I'm kind of beating this like a dead horse, but I've seen it in far too many companies where really talented people feel that they're not welcome and not encouraged to contribute in ways that are outside of their narrow silo. Um, some of the ways you can do also cross-pollination is what they do with Pixar University. They have random classes, like totally not related to work, like pottery. And so you have a unit production manager, an animator, a layout artist who's doing environment work, you, and you've got you know, somebody else that's working, maybe the janitor's there, and they're all working and they're doing and they're talking about things. So those ideas are free to cross-pollinate. We'll look at some other crazy ideas, like Steve Jobs wanting only one bathroom in the center of the building, trying to get cross-pollination to happen. We'll look at that in a little bit, too. So, uh, real quick on RenderMan. 27 of the last 30 films that have won the Oscar for visual effects use RenderMan. This is a shader. This shader right here is going to, at the very top, we look real quick. 
Uh, it's going to set the perspective to a field of view of 45 degrees, and then you set the camera. Um, it, then we have a file name, and then we talk about the world. There are three lights, so anybody who's ever done traditional lighting, you have your key light, your fill light, and your kicker. That's what that defines. Commented out is just an ambient light that would just give an even lighting throughout the scene. We say the surface is going to be a plastic surface, and then we have two spheres, basically. One is stretched, one is not, and one is, so the color is RGB, one zero, zero to one is the, instead of zero to 255. Uh, and the, um, the bottom one is squished, basically. So that's, that's a very simple shader. This is a far more complex shader, and what most of that stuff, it used to be that all those shaders were written by hand. Then they made a bunch of tools that made it so it's a bunch of, all these things are now sliders and, and artist tools and it's a lot easier to, to manipulate this. But this is a skin shader. This is how a, a, a rendering just of skin is defined. There's like 20 or 30 of these that go into making up a human character. And when they render things out, here's all the different render passes that get taken out of the computer. So all these things, beauty is like everything combined together. But the Z depth there, ambient lighting, uh, ambient, uh, I can't read that. Yeah, so amb ambient raw, then uh, ambient occlusion here on the left, that's just kind of like where the ambient light is blocked. That's what that shadow is. Um, the color looks really flat because there's no shadow in it. Diffusion, diffuse no shadow. So all these things are then taken and combined to make that final image. And if you think about the tech, the top is Toy Story 1, the bottom is Toy Story 4. The bottom is not a photograph. Pretty crazy. That's both render man. But that can show you where that's 1993, that's... 2018. And again, 1993, 2018. Um, and what used to take, like, that used to be the final render. That's now what, like, the artist gets to manipulate in real time, is that top view. And this is 25 years of tech development. We'd hope we can do that, right? So, uh, I mean, every year they're doing a short. This is from Piper. Um, and the photo reel levels here, I mean, look at the sand detail and the, the, the depth of field in the camera and all this stuff and the feather detail. This is the kind of stuff that, that we're starting to work on. But they can now, this is, you know, you can still work with the, 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 the positioning and instead of seeing a wireframe, you're seeing a pretty decent representation of what your final frame is going to look like. So this is what Pixar has done for 30 years now. They've built what they need and then they've shared it with the world. You can download Renderman right now, run it on your computer for free. And it's fun to do. If you're bored, you'd want to play with some of the stuff and see what it does. It's, it's kind of fun. Um, one of the other things they do is extensive research, immersive research. This is something uh, I complain pretty much at every company I've ever at. That UX teams never get to do the research they need to do. The research isn't, oh, I talked to, to this one person, the customer on the phone, and they said they wanted X. The thing this is going and sitting with your customer in actual places and actual places. So this people. is when they so were doing really Coco and they actually go into Mexico. This is before they've even started shooting. They've got a story concept. We they haven't visited written a script or anything. So they're like everything they're learning and pulling in is informing their product, their film. For art, for story and characters, it was just so informative. We were experiencing and the there's really no the way to and the sights and this incredible to, to fake this like I mean, there's there's a couple of US people go to go to media in San Francisco does this she literally follows people with a camera around because if I'm gonna use a mobile app I'm not sitting there using it in the lab right I'm using it here I'm sitting here in the middle of a crowded hallway trying to check something uh, I'm checking the weather while I've got one kid screaming one kid that needs a diaper change and somebody else asking if I remember to pack a lunch do you mind so there's no way to replicate immersive research. So whenever you can, go ahead and do that. And we'll finish up here real quick with Making Spaces, which is not an HGTV show. Um, so I have really strong opinions here because of my architecture background. And um, I've had some really bad experiences working. This is Living Social, which is no more. But this is the Living Social headquarters in DC. This is a miserable place to work. Not because it was Living Social, but because of the space. Hard concrete floors, hard, hard walls reflective surfaces, engineering on one half of the room, sales on the other. Every engineer had noise canceling headphones and blinders on. It was like literally trying to block out the noise of the room. And they wondered why nobody, like half of us started working from home. And they wondered why. Like, just bad. And, and I mean, thankfully this open office crap is finally going away. <laughs> People are realizing these are not the best ways. Yes, they're super efficient to your cost centers, but they are horrible for your employees. So looking at Pixar, <clears throat> when they built their new campus in Emeryville, 
the, the main building is phase one. This is phase two over here on the side, this bottom building. Um, Jobs was the primary designer because, of course, right? Um, he's not going to let somebody else put their name on it. He, I designed Pixar. Um, but he said, I want one bathroom in the center of the building. Everyone has to come to the atrium to go to the bathroom. That's a pretty long walk. Uh, and his argument was, well, then everyone will have to talk to each other. Force interaction. If they have to go to, they have to stand in line for the same bathroom. Thankfully, there's a lot of bathrooms throughout Pixar. He did not win this argument. But the concept, not necessarily wrong. So if you start talking about, this is the expansion area. This is the, the second thing. Central atrium, entrance, food, interaction, the theater, big group events. Then it moves off into pod areas with some cubes, and then mostly offices, and then smaller collaborative spaces public to private. And if you look at, this is in the main building again. So here's the cafeteria on the bottom, and these are these hallways with conference rooms above. Look at this hallway. This hallway is meant to be lived in. It is not a space to walk through. They even do go so far as to put chairs in the middle of it. People are supposed to stop here and collaborate and talk. They give each employee a budget to build out their own space. So this is you know an animator here. This is kind of like a team area here on the right. This is, a, this is as close as they, that I saw when we, we did the tour of Pixar. This is as close as I ever saw to a cubicle. And it's a pretty, I mean, you could shut the door there. That's pretty great. I would love a cube like that in, in, in an office space. And then they got more larger, you know, this is an edit suite. And so behind here, what you can't see is that there's a whole bunch of sofas and stuff for people to come watch and, and collaborate with the editor. But normally, this guy's working alone and, and doing a build, and then people come watch it. So office design encourages collaboration. And I know what you're going to say. We can't do that in tech companies. That's Pixar. They got millions of dollars. We can't have great creative spaces. Bull. Fog Creek, New York City. Fog Creek Software. This is their, they've been working on this problem for a decade easy. This is their second iteration. Their first one, they did all these diagonal offices where the wall intersected a table and it was wide enough to pair and all sorts of cool things like this. And they built a lot of these in here too. But their space is more now people coming and going. It's less permanent offices. So developers have offices with a door that can close, but this, this space also supports sales and other teams. Uh, personal offices for standalone work, uh, but then the desks again are wide enough for easy pairing. Workstations down here for independent or our, our individual co-working. Phone booths over here on the right that are basically isolated rooms people can go into for, for silence. Uh, and then there's the, the conference room, which is the quiet car for, again, larger group and also, again, audio quietness. Um, so environmental design affects productivity and happiness. So please fix it if you can. If you have any say in this in your company, please fight for it. If you liked a lot of this stuff, I barely have scratched the surface of this book. So if, if you are interested in creative management and, and collaboration, this is Ed Catmull's book, and it's well worth the read. Uh, I'm also working on this, a course called Developer UX. So UX for developers. I'll be around for a little bit if you have any questions. <laughs>